Hello, little chicken boos. Um, good work last week. I'm proud of you. I'm, I'm actually filming this on Friday, so I should say good work this week. I'm very proud of all the effort you're doing in person, and I appreciate all the hard work you're doing at home because it's really tough to be doing what you're doing at home, and I'm, I think you're kicking butt. Okay. I actually decided to cut this video into two sections because it was too long and I'll try to keep it short and sweet as best I can, but I find this stuff interesting so it's easy for me to get long-winded, so just bear with me. So I'm calling this lecture The Three Stages of Ceramics. This is going to be part one where I'm just going to talk about greenware and bisqueware. And next lecture, I'll get more in depth with glazing and glazeware. So the three stages of ceramics are greenware, bisqueware, and then glazeware. So as your piece is fired and changes, it has these three different names. Okie dokie. So the first stage you all know very well is greenware. Greenware is clay that has not been fired in a kiln, has not seen any heat <laughs> um, yet. So it's clay straight out of the bag or straight out of the ground um, and it is wet. <laughs> uh, we call it three different um, terms as it dries. So greenware as it's drying out. When it's fresh out of the bag, it's wet plastic clay and wet plastic clay is very stretchable. And then as it dries, slowly the water evaporates out of the clay. We call it leather hard because as, as it dries, it literally hardens. Um, and leather hard clay is great for carving. Um, it's carvable. It's no longer stretchable. It's carvable. And then we're going to dry our pieces very slowly to prevent cracking until they are bone dry. Um, sometimes you hear the saying dry as a bone and you think of those um, like cow skulls out in the desert, like dry as a bone. So greenware is clay that hasn't been fired. It's whether it's wet, plastic, leather hard, or bone dry. Sometimes we'll even call um, a stage between leather hard and bone dry chocolate hard. Mm, yum, yum, yum. So anyway, that's greenware. You know it very well. Um, we could work in wet greenware and never fire our pieces and that would be fine, but that wouldn't be ceramics. That would be clay class. And ceramics is when you fire your clay to make it permanent. And when you fire clay in the kiln, it lasts or it has the potential of lasting a very, very long time. So um, this little lady right here is the oldest known piece of fired clay. Um, it was discovered in the Czech Republic and it's four and a half inches tall and it is 26,000 years old from the Upper Paleolithic. Let's see if I can say her name right. It's the Venus of Deloni Vestonice. Vestonice! Yay, I did it. Um, she's a beauty. She's got a nice little booty and some like lovely little chichis here. Um, she looks like a very exaggerated female figure. Um, and um, on the site where they were excavating, they found two of these sort of like dug out holes that were kilns. And so the people, um, they were living in these little huts and they were hunter gatherers during the upper, upper Paleolithic. And what they think they were doing was they were just experimenting, like finding clay and making little things and putting them in the fire. And then they discovered that when they put the clay pieces in the fire, um, that they would come out hard and permanent. So they found lots and lots of different um, little shapes and tools. They found little animal skulls and they found this uh, figurine. Um, this is right around the same time as people were carving bone and wood into little um, figures. Um, they don't think that this was necessarily a fertility goddess because um, hunter-gatherer people were um, 
not interested in overpopulation because they couldn't support overpopulation. So what they believe that this is really about is just an aesthetic ideal that it was a symbol of beauty or just like the earliest um, expressions of the artistic impulse. It was like our er first desire as people to want to make something beautiful and um, have that artistic impulse. And we still have it. It's still in your little bodies. Um, and they say this had no practical purpose. It wasn't like a spoon or a bowl or something, but it was a way that people um, had the need to make things. And um, it kind of led to potentially making things that were um, more permanent. But actually, it took 14,000 more years before people figured out to turn clay into pots and jars and functional things. So this was like so much older than those early, early first little simple pinch pots and things that people were making to drink out of. Anyways, she's beautiful. I love her. Let's go. Um, so for 10,000 years, kind of going back a little more recently, like from, from her, people started figuring out that they could uh, take some clay from the ground and mold it and then make it permanent by firing it in these kind of open pits and, and kilns using heat. And what's interesting about this process is going back to um, the lava granite clay um, cycle, is we're basically taking the clay, heating it, and turning it back into its sort of granite type stage. So that makes sense. So it's like the cycle is going full circle here. So the first kilns that people fire the stuff in were just open pits. Then they started to develop these sort of beehive shapes where they would have a chamber above for all the pots. This looks like Greek, you know, Greek and Roman kind of era time. And they would have a little firebox or like almost like a chimney. It's like a glorified chimney or fireplace underneath. And the heat would cycle through the pots and out the little chimney at the top, uh, the flue or the damper. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then in China, they developed these things called dragon kilns or down, they were downdraft kilns where they would control the flow of the heat through the kiln. So this one, the heat rises and goes up through it. And on this one, there's a little firebox down here and the heat flows up over this little beehive arch and then down through the pots and then up and then down through the pots. And they found that by forcing the heat downward, it would get hotter and they could control things more specifically. And then here was the little flue or the chimney with another little damper, which I'll talk about what the damper is um, in our next video next week. Okay. All right. So going back to your greenware, how do you know when your greenware is ready to fire? When is it ready to go in the kiln? Um, there's three important things that you need to make sure before you put it in the kiln. Number one, is your piece totally bone dry? If it's wet, we're going to have some trouble. We're going to create steam in that firing and that steam is going to cause explosions. Um, is it thinner than an inch? Um, if your piece is thicker, if the wall of your piece is thicker than an inch, then that moisture, the water inside, can get trapped and it needs to escape, and that'll cause cracking or explosions. And then lastly, is it properly ventilated? Right now we're making a big bowl, which is plenty ventilated. It's a hole. It's a giant hole. But um, in future projects, we might be creating little bubbles of clay and if you want to make, uh, in this case, this little bunny, or here is a little fishy, um, where you want to have like a solid piece, but it can't be totally solid, you'll make a bubble out of clay. And that bubble needs to have a hole in it so that the air inside can escape. Um, what happens is as the piece is heated, um, the clay bubble starts to shrink and expand and contract and it'll literally like rupture and crack open like an egg. And that's what happened here with this little fishy. It's just big cracked open. Over here with our little bunny, his little booty here 
exploded because it was way too thick. And if there's layers and layers and way too much clay that's super thick, it traps all the moisture inside. And at around 212 degrees, that moisture becomes steam and psh, explodes. And then this is a situation, here's another ceramic failure, where it's possible this person loaded this whole kiln full of wet, wet work and turned it on. And um, basically the steam forms in the whole clay body and just explodes like <laughs> um, in a million little pieces of rubble. Um, and it's a real bummer, man, when your stuff explodes because A, you worked really hard on your piece and it blew up and then B, it might blow up and knock into somebody else's piece and damage their stuff and that's not cool, okay? Alrighty, so these little guys are, Scut is the brand, electric kilns and electric kilns use electricity to heat um, inside the kiln. A kiln, we call it a kiln, is not an oven. Your oven goes up to about 400 degrees, and that's great, but these guys go up to about 2,000 degrees. This little kiln, we could take your oven, put it inside, and it would melt it down. It's like, this come, this oven eats ovens. <laughs> it's, oh, 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 it's got a lot of power. Um, these little guys run on the same amount of power as your dryer or your washer at home. So um, they are great for home studios. And they have these little red boxes on the side. These are little super simple onboard computers that I use to program the firing schedules for the first firing, which is the bales. So top loaders. These are skets. So the first firing we call the bisque firing. And um, I'll say, oh, we're baking biscuits, kiddos. And um, I should know, but I don't know why we call it the bisque, but we call it that, all right? Just, I just know it. Um, so you take your greenware and you put it into the bisque. And um, a typical firing trajectory looks like this, kind of like a slow, steady climb. Um, and that's why the electric kilns are really great for this. And there's a couple of important things, magical things that happen in that first firing. The first one is at 212 degrees, that's when atmospheric drying happens and steam forms. So this is a key moment early on in the temperature um, climbing of the kiln. And that's why everything has to be super dry when we put it in there. Um, and fire it up. That's when stuff likes to blow up. So 212, that's steam and um, explosions ha can happen in there. Then between 500 and 1100 or 1000 degrees, this is when the chemical water and carbon and other things start to burn off um, in the clay. And um, like when I was saying that clay is made of alumina, silica, and water. This is when that chemical water in the um, in its molecular structure, the little tetrahedron, it burns off um, right during this cycle, this kind of slower middle cycle. And then at 1100 degrees, something magical happens right in the middle of the firing, and it is what makes ceramic super special, it's called quartz inversion. Uh, remember we are talking about granite and we are saying that a big component of granite rock is quartz, like those moonstones parts of the rocks. This is when the mud turns back into the stone. Like I was saying, like it goes from lava, it cools and turns to granite. Granite breaks down, turns into clay. Now we're taking clay reintroducing heat you know like the earth's core the heat and it's going to chemically and physically change um the structure of the clay back into a solid so it goes from being like that plastic liquid gooey schmooey stuff into like a rock hard um material it's awesome 
it's so cool. And um, this is something that was discovered, you know, 26,000 years ago by Paleolithic people that we are still doing it and using it today. And it's all because of the quartz inversion. Magical. All right. And then here at CHS, we keep firing the, the clay up a little bit further because at quartz inversion, the clay is still very brittle. And so it needs to, to um, heat up and compress and um, get a little bit tougher um, for a, a little bit further. When we go up to 1855, uh, things out in the way but about 1855 1832 aka we call it cone 06 and i will explain more about that next week so 200 degrees steam forms 1100 degrees quartz inversion and then 1855 is cone 06 maturity that's the best firing hooray oh no here we go so here's what it looks like it, when we load the kiln, we put all our little pots in there. Um, this is looking inside of an electric kiln that uses these elements that heat up um, to, you know, to fire the pots inside. And then here, this photo shows if you were to lift the lid of a firing kiln, which is very dangerous. No, 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 you will not do this. Um, because imagine inside the kiln when they opened it up, it's about 1,800 degrees, potentially. That will burn you severely. That's third degree burns. That's very bad. That's burning flesh and burning bone. Not okay. That's why you got to make sure you're always on the lookout for those pink hot kiln signs and never touch the kiln unless I'm there with you asking for help. But it's still cool to look at. <laughs> and then... When your clay piece comes out of the bisque firing, it has a new name. It emerges as bisque ware. So the piece goes into the firing, we call it green ware. And when it comes out of the first firing, we call it bisque ware. Hello. Um, and bisque ware is usually a little bit lighter. Like it'll come out and you'll be like, wow, all that water is, is now gone. It weighs a little bit less. You might see a little color change. Darker colored clays tend to look kind of pink or this kind of nice umber color or white. Um, our gray um, bee mix comes out kind of like a, still like a light pink color even. It's porous. It's still brittle. It's stronger than it was before, but it's still a little bit delicate and brittle. Like you can knock it over and chip it and then you're sad. But mainly what it is, is it's glazable. Um, bisqueware is nice, but it's not great to eat off of. It's going to be um, dry and um, icky. So we're going to glaze it next. And glazing can be done um, lots of different ways. We can brush it on with a paintbrush. You can pour it over the pot like this. You can dip it in a big bucket full of glaze, or you can spray it with an airbrush. And um, next week, we're going to be talking about glaze, what is it, and glazing and the special glaze firing. So today was all about greenware and the first firing, the bisque and bisqueware. And I really appreciate your time. And thank you for listening. And have a great, great week. I'll see you soon, my boosh.